Coming up, a Sad Styles production. Hello and welcome. My name is Mikey Aaronworth, signing on to the Sign Off, a Frameworth podcast for yet another week. It is the podcast where we talk about all the stories that you didn't know you wished you knew about the world of sports marketing. And I'm sitting here across the room from my dad, Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth Sports Marketing, who's already smirking and smiling. What did I do this time? No, I kept I, it so professional. I, I always wait for some zinger you're going to put in right at the beginning, and it just hit me as funny because I was trying to anticipate what it is and you didn't do it. Well, now I've got you on your back foot. I like it. This is good. I'm always going to keep you on edge. Uh, we are also joined uh, uh, by guests this week. That's right, guests, plural. Uh, this is our first episode with two guests apart from my dad and myself. They have recently released their second book titled Great Two, a follow-up to the 2016 bestseller Great, published by Random House and illustrated by Kevin Sylvester. But their work doesn't end there, having been major players in the Wayne Gretzky Foundation and Wayne Gretzky Estates, among many other ventures, which we're sure to get into. We are joined via Zoom by Glenn Gretzky and Lori Holomis. Glenn, Lori, how are you guys Hello. doing today? Great. Hey, guys. Great. Just for the listeners, so you're aware, we're doing this over Zoom, slightly different uh, process than we normally do. So forgive any growing pains if there are any to be experienced, but we're going to keep it as streamlined as possible. Um, we have two key elements, I think, uh, this week that we want to touch on. Um, the book and a lot about the foundation and, and the winery as well, the Wayne Gretzky uh, uh, winery, Gretzky Estates as well. Um, but we're not going to really let that limit where the conversation goes. I want to start by getting to know the two of you. Uh, Lori, why don't you start us off by telling the listener a little bit about yourself and what you're currently working on. You're the VP of Sponsorships and Events at BioSteel. Uh, what, is that, what does that entail and how did you get involved in the realm of sports? Uh, well, I've been involved in the realm of sports basically since the, be <laughs> the beginning of time, like way back in <laughs> university days in Edmonton. Yeah. So um, it's funny because when Glennie and I talk about a lot of the things that we've done, I'm like, can we say we like not say we've been doing it for 20 years? Can it maybe just be 10? <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. We so won't fact time, check it. We won't fact check it. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, I've been working in sports since uh, really literally in university. I started um, one of my first jobs was with the Edmonton Trappers. And at, back then, um, the owner also owned the Oilers as well. So I ended up doing some work with the Oilers. And that's how I got involved. In That's a lot of the uh, the Gretzky world, which is really exciting and helping with the, the Jersey retirement and doing lots of fun events with Glenny um, for the foundation and for, you know, as Brian, you've been to fantasy camp so many times and just having a lot of fun. Glenny and I ran the um, Ford Wayne Gretzky nationwide tour as well in three years up in Collingwood. So we've got uh, Glenn and I work together as partners in a lot of different ventures and different opportunities, a lot of fundraisers and really just a lot of community things that we've really enjoyed doing and working together. So that's where I kind of started in sports back in the, you know, trappers and then working with the Oilers and um, then just got into working with uh, Glenn and Wayne and the family and Walter, of course, and just, you know, I've been really fortunate and really blessed to have being able to work together with them and being friends for so long. It's been a really great life for me. Sounds great. Now you mentioned the fantasy camp and we've talked about this on the, the podcast uh, quite often. So I'm, I'm excited to talk to the two of you about that kind of a uh, peek behind the curtains of what goes on from your end. But uh, before we do that, um, any particular involvement with sports, any reason why sports was what you wanted to, to, to do as uh, growing up, was this always an idea for you that, that in some capacity you wanted to work parallel to the industry in some way? Uh, you know what? I played sports my whole life and um, we moved around a lot as a family. So I found that, you know, as soon as you get on a team in a new school, right away, you have some friends, right? So that was kind of what really helped me really enjoy sports a lot more as I made friends right away. And no matter what city we were in, you know, you had a team, literally a team behind you. So uh, I've always been in, involved in sports, always loved it. You know, we've worked on a lot of projects, but those are always our favorite. I mean, we've been really fortunate with a lot of the athletes that we obviously, you know, working with Wayne and Walter and, and the family has been is number one for sure. Um, and other than that, just, you know, a lot of the different events that Glennie and I've done together, there's a lot of different athletes and celebrities yeah. and the athletes are always just good hearted and kind and great people to work with. So we've been really, really fortunate. Great. Yeah, we uh, we talk about that. We had a great conversation last week with Chris King about uh, the difference in athlete mentality 
uh, among hockey players in mm-hmm. particular. You know, we mm-hmm. work in sports marketing, so that crosses quite a few uh, different types of sports. And there's something about hockey players that we always love yeah. coming back to. There's a groundedness. Sure. Uh, I think there's a large team element, not only to the way the game is played, but also the family style of having to get the kids and the entire group to the rink day in, day out. Um, mm-hmm. You did mention the fantasy camp, and I want to sort of let that lead into a conversation about the Wayne Gretzky Foundation as well. Uh, Glenn, executive director of the Wayne Gretzky Foundation, and brand manager for Gretzky Estates. Um, you've had enormous hand uh, as, as sort of a, 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 a little transition here in facilitating the famous, as we mentioned, uh, Wayne Gretzky hockey camp, uh, fantasy camp during its run. That's how you and I first met. It's how we kind of got to know each other. I'm sure that's how you and my dad bonded quite a bit as well. All of us to know each other pretty well. I think well, that's yeah. how we all met. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, now what, uh, apart from the fantasy camp specifically, those are two pretty heavy titles, executive director of the foundation and brand manager of the estates. What, what is involved in your day to day to help sort of facilitate the brand and, and grow, uh, in these two different environments? Well, with, with the, the winery, it, it's been a bit of a challenge just with COVID the last couple of years, of course, and being shut down. So that was interesting, but. On a day-to-day basis, it's more or less, you know, pr- promoting uh, Gretzky Estates, the brand, coming up with different products, we're different labels, different packaging, etc. So, you know, it, it's it's a grind in in a way where, you know, because we were shut down, that was a big part of our business. But yeah. you know, there are positives on that side too. Our e-commerce business is booming. Right. Uh, we're in the process of in the next year or so, we're going to be opening up a winery in Kelowna, which is, oh, is going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, it won't be quite as big as uh, the one in Niagara on the Lake, but it's still going to be, it'll, it'll be a big footprint there for sure. Well, I've, I'm curious because obviously the 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 Gretzky name is a big name. I mean that that's something that allows you as as a brand to really open up a lot of doors, right? I mean it, it is in and of itself uh, uh, something that turns heads. Just just the name itself, and I, I often wonder when you're you building something like Gretzky Estates, how much of your consciousness goes into using the name to advertise the brand, but also to make sure the brand itself remains consistent and quality apart from just the name. I mean, I, I bet you a lot of people come by and think, oh, Gretzky Estates, let's try it out. But once they're in the door, you still have to make sure that it's a quality product. How, how do you balance that that effort in terms of both building the brand because you are a brand manager there at Gretzky Estates and also ensuring that the quality offered in that company remains uh, uh, to exceed people's expectations? Well, first of all, we have an amazing partner with John Peller and, uh, Andrew Peller Limited, and it's it really is an amazing team. Uh, I, I was there on the weekend actually, and I I, I sent the, the manager a note. I'm like, it is maybe the greatest place to go. The the staff is fantastic. Just everything is top notch, and 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 I think you know, sure you have a name, but if the product isn't good, then it's not going to sell. For sure, and we have fabulous winemakers beer makers it, it the, the product it can stand up to anybody it it, it really is uh, truly amazing the research that goes into it and the, the the development of each each product whether it's the whiskey cream or uh, new wine or new flavor and beer the, the the time and the research that goes into it is just absolutely incredible and that I, I give that to John and his team, uh, the, the the attention to detail that they put in there, and they understand the brand, and they understand what comes with that, and and the name, and you know everybody doesn't want to, you know, basically you're not going to put out crap, you know, it's not going to sell. So mm-hmm. everyone, sure. we're all on the same, we're all on the same page there. And it's been a remarkable, geez, I think we're getting close to 15 years here on a partnership, and it's just been amazing. I I have to say here too that um, there's been a, a number of celebrities that got into this business and and your name will hold mm-hmm. up to get you the recognition at the beginning but if you don't have the quality product and and I know as a wine drinker and a beer drinker that the the product that they're serving is excellent and matter of fact I enjoy it so much for one of my birthdays the kids got together and uh, flew got a private plane just a little prop plane from Buttonville Airport and flew me down to Niagara I'm sorry we couldn't afford a, a G6 for you dad wow <laughs> 
But no, the G5 one of the amazing. Wasn't in the budget? <laughs> no, unfortunately not for that one. Yeah, yeah. But there was a limo picking us up at the other end. Anyways, we did the wine okay, tours down there. But <laughs> the highlight of the wine tour was uh, was the Gretzky Winery, which w- is amazing. What a fantastic place, yeah. jam packed. This is a couple of years back. There's so much to do there, so much to see. And then to do the tastings and and do the tour of the winery and all that, if you ever get a chance to do it, it is a phenomenal place to go. Yeah, uh, Lori, I know that you're pretty heavily involved as as we mentioned with BioSteel now. But were were you? Did you have a hand in sort of the opening? We mentioned how long it, it has been uh, mm-hmm. uh, around. Were, were you involved in that in in the the envisioning of what the the winery would be and and how to sort of make that come to be? Well, we um, Glennie and I like you know, way back at the beginning, um, worked on the first deal together, getting it actually started and up and running for sure. And then, um, Glenn worked with John Peller to, to get to the next level. But, uh, for the opening of the building, we had a lot of fun because we got to, um, tell the story within the building. So I wasn't involved in the structure or anything that Glenn probably was, but Glenn and I got to work together on the storytelling within. So once you walk into it and you see the photos and you, you see, you read about the history and all the fun kind of interesting. I mean, honestly, we've got some stories. I hope this is okay, Glenny, where we we went into, you know, the closet in the Gretzky home and Walter's home and looked through old photo albums and found some amazing pictures and amazing keepsakes. So, and those are some of that, that you'll see at the winery that you haven't seen before. Awesome. And storytelling. I like, I like that as a, as a little bit of a, a caveat because we're going to be getting into great and great too. And Lori, I know you had a huge hand in the development of those books, uh, uh, both of which I've read and, and I have many questions about, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into that. When you guys though were first uh, making the winery, it, it was a winery. Had you always envisioned that it would become more of an estate like it is now. I mean, well, it's a destination place. It's it's absolutely a destination place. You know, it's not just about a winery. You have a brewer in Laura Milico, uh, Mixology, Zach Kvass, a chef, Marie D'Arnay. I mean, this is this is a, a destination as opposed to just a winery that provides bottles of wine that you can pull off the shelf. Was that always in the cards or had you just thought one step at a time, let's, let's make some wine and see where it takes us? No, I, I think right from the beginning, the vision was to make it a destination point. And I, I'm pretty sure we're getting close to probably being one of the most visited wineries in the world. Mm-hmm. Like we'll wow. probably have over 300,000 visitors this year. So wow, the, the vision was, the vision, uh, John and his team, we went out to our family farm uh, just outside of Paris. And the, the concept was sort of design it kind of like uh, the barn that was that was on the the, the homestead out in Paris, so that that's w- sort of where the barn look comes from. And oh, as so soon you as base you, you base that off of the the design of of the far, like your your family's farmstead. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's and, I didn't realize. That's cool. That. I didn't that's know awesome. that either. And when you walk in right in the lobby, there's a huge, huge picture, aerial picture, aerial view of the of the farm, and that's sort of where the the barn would come that look sort of came from. And then the inside, what we wanted to do, you know, there was already obviously the Hockey Hall of Fame and Gretzky's restaurant in Toronto and right. my dad's basement. And there was just, I mean, trophies are everywhere. Trophies, yeah. awards. Sure. I mean, the, oh my God. As my trophies lit them up in yeah. different trophies. places. That's there's still it. be lots. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So w- what we wanted to do was make it more of, more almost like an art gallery storytelling type feel and look i I think there's well there's only one room that has the only trophies are in there are the replica trophies of the stanley cup the art ross the heart lady bing i think campbell conference whatever sure but that's the only trophies that are in there the the rest is more as soon as you walk in there's picture of wayne i think when he was two or three, and then it just follows from there as his career progressed, right from breaking Gordy's record, first Stanley Cup, breaking Gordy's record, uh, meeting the queen, uh, drop, uh, lighting the cauldron for the Olympics. Right. Um, those kind of, it's those stories and pictures that a lot of people hadn't seen before that are in there now. So I, I the, like that. The, 
I like that as as a, as a brand. I think it's so apparent what 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 the the Gretzky brand does so well, and what everyone involved does so well is is you know it. And it it's weird that you know for, for a nickname like the Great One, it's not just about being great in the sense of you know amassing a huge amount of points and winning all the time. And and you go over this in the books as well, which we'll start to transition to. But great means something different than just being very good at something. It, it as 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 Walter would have said, it has a lot more to do with the effort that you put in. That's what makes someone great. And you really do get that sense uh, with with the 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 design of the winery, with the tone of the books as well, that the Gretzky brand is now more about something different than just winning. It's about as as you're as you're explaining this, Glenn. It's it's giving people a sense of of family, you know, about the achievements that come as a result of having done something great, not necessarily because you know a Stanley Cup was won, but you know you lit the torch for the Olympics. That's a community thing. It's not just happening to to one team on the ice. And it, by inviting people into this atmosphere that mimics that of your your family farmstead. I mean, it just feels like you're opening up your arms and saying, like, guys, we can all be a part of this as long as we strive to be great, essentially. And and I'd like to use that as a transition to, to talk uh, about the books a little bit. Uh, great and Great 2, published by Penguin Random House, uh, Puffin as well for, for Great 2, uh, illustrated, as I mentioned, by Kevin Sylvester. The first book came out in September of 2016, and if you're watching this over on YouTube, uh, Lori's background actually has the two covers of the books. Uh, they're available in bookstores near you. They're also available uh, in e-reader format as well, if, if you want the convenience of that. Um, I want to have a quick conversation about, about how the idea of the first book came to be. And I'm not sure which of you wants to jump on this question uh, in terms of the initial spark of an idea for for a book, but what got the two of you talking together, uh, because it's the two of you who are credited for for creating the book, about potentially bringing something to, to be? What, what, walk us through those first moments. Go ahead, Laura. Okay, sure. Um, so as I mentioned before, Glennie and I are partners on a lot of things and work together on a lot of different events and stuff. And there were so many times that we're at an event and you've all seen it. It's it's hard for you to go anywhere and with any meeting and not have somebody who has a Walter story, right? Yes. So um, we were watching Wally with the kids and they're just so enthralled with him all the time. He always had such great advice. He always had questions that the kids had to answer. He always said, are you, you know, are you making sure you're saying please and thank you? Are you being kind? Are you doing your best, right? All these different great coaching moments and not just to kids, um, but to families and not just in Canada, but literally around the world. Right. Right. And so Glennie and I were sitting there talking like, like at, at that time, my son was my time. My son is nine now. He's a lot younger than, and we're like, like, I want Wyatt to have all these great quotes from, from your dad. And, and Glenn's like, yeah, Wyatt we being need your, to, your son for the list. My son, sorry, my yep. son, yeah, yep. my son and Wyatt. And, um, Glennie's like, yeah, like there's, there's different, we got to figure out how to do this. And we just started talking like we, there's books on Walter and different things, but there's not a kid's book. Right. So we were just, it, we just, it really came organically. It was just from one of those conversations that we've had. And it's funny because often we'll have these conversations, you know, in a kitchen or something like that, or over a glass of Gretzky wine and all there of a sudden go. this great idea comes and things happen. Right. And that's how it happened with us. We just wanted to make sure that Walter's legacy, I mean, he's got his own legacy. That's amazing. But for the kids coming up, the younger ones to have these stories and it's not, it's not just a hockey story. It's like, it's a, a life story, right? It, these are lessons that these kids right. um, and the parents can keep forever. So we keep saying it, it's a book, but it's also a really great keepsake. And so that's why we're hoping, um, you know, we get to do more of these because Walter had just so many great moments and um, motivation and inspiration and coachable times with kids and families and and everybody. So we just want to kind of keep that going. And and that's where it came from. Right. You know, I, I was just going to say, because I delved into publishing for Eddie Shack's book, but you had no background experience in, in publishing no. a book. So it's an interesting process, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you, you know, put together some, I, had, you get I had a little bit of a I had a little bit of experience on my dad's book after yeah. he had Oh, his right, aneurysm. right, right. Yeah, so, we did a book called Waking Up Wally. Right. And that came from when he got out of the hospital and we could see the transition happening. And we're like, hey, you know, we should start uh, taking notes here. So I would take notes and just write things down. And a bit of a diary almost is what I'd say. And then, uh, and then I took it to Random House and uh, presented the idea of going, this would be great for people to 
see how rehabilitation does work and how you have to cope with uh, brain aneurysm and how it affects family. And I mean, my dad lost all his memory. Right. And it was, you know, when he came home from the hospital, basically he was like, you know, like a four or five year old. Wow. And from what happened in the geez, next 20 years or whatever was just absolutely amazing. Miraculous. Yeah. So we, so I had, I had some experience in that and then we took it and, uh, and then CBC turned it into a movie and it, it just kind of went from there. And then, then Lori and I, as she was saying, we, we started talking about, Hey, geez, you know, there's just really nothing for, for kids kind of Walter. And, and I had coached uh, minor hockey with my dad for a few years. And so I kind of knew when Lori and I started chatting about him, I'm like, Hey, you know, I had the firsthand experience watching my dad, you know, on a bus with kids, if we'd go to a tournament or, you know, in the hotel rooms or in practices or just sitting in the dress room and just things that he would share with the kids. It was just like, it was amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a, a, a series of shows just on your dad and just my limited time with him, which, you know, I've had a number of experience, especially around the hockey camp and watching him uh, and what he, and the, and the, and the kind of individual he was and how giving he was. I, I told a story on the air about the Olympics at 2002 when we were walking out of the, out of the uh, rink with uh, Brad Jansen and people are all over your, your dad trying to get autographs and, or, and photos. And, and he didn't wear a jacket. And it was crazy. And he wouldn't leave until yeah. everybody had a photograph. And not just a photograph, but a photograph with the, the stadium in the background. If they didn't take the right photograph, he'd say, you got to do it again. <laughs> he, he was just such an amazing man. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, you can't say enough good things about him. Yeah, yeah. It, it does feel well, like we, he... we went to uh, We went to the Olympics in um, Torino. And you know Blakey, uh, Brian. Yep. Yeah, so Blakey was with us and a couple of Wayne's friends and my dad and myself. So there was five of us in an apartment in Torino because we just couldn't get hotel rooms, right? Because right, the Olympics. Right. Not much there. And so he he became he was like father grandpa to everyone in the <laughs> in the apartment. So after about four or five days, we phoned Wayne. We're like. Okay, we we we're voting him off the island. <laughs> we're like, he's, he's, moving in with he's like he's moving in with you for a few days. <laughs> so we we get to the arena for one of the games, and it was just Darren and I looked at each other at the exact same time and said, "Okay, what are we missing? We're trying to vote him off the island, and there's three thousand people in the lineup to get his autograph and picture. What are we missing?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It, it oh, does, oh my god it feels like three thousand people trying to get to him and we're trying to get, get yeah. him away for three days well i it always <laughs> that's always the case with the people closest to us as well right and it takes a moment like that to realize sometimes just how special someone is i mean i it, it, it that feels like yeah. a like again a very relatable family moment which which is is nice oh, to yeah, hear we still laughing. goes on even even at, at every level essentially um, oh, you we mentioned, you mentioned the yeah. book, uh, the, the, the book, uh, the book on family hockey and healing. And then there was a movie, a, a, a made for TV movie, waking up Wally that was based on that. Were you involved in the production of, of that movie as well? A very well received movie. Uh, I believe it came out in yeah, 2005 I was, one of the, so. I was one of the producers on it. Yes. Right. And what was that experience like, uh, uh, producing, but it seems like you're, you're willing to sort of jump in with both feet and take on these projects, like, uh, you know, producing a movie or, or writing a book, uh, that you may have had no prior experiences to, is that something that you learned from your dad as well? You know, teaching bravery and confidence, confidence, especially being the theme of the second book. Great too. Uh, would that be a, a quality you say you had learned from, from your dad? Oh, 100%. I think he, he always instilled in us, you know, you try anything, you know, and what you are, what, if you, what you, if you are going to try something, make sure you give it a hundred percent. And I think that's what he taught all of us. And so I was never afraid of, you know, Hey, I remember when I first pitched the idea of waking up Wally, the book, I took it to somebody, I took it to one publisher and they said, you know what? This is probably just a three, four part story in the Toronto Star. Wow. So like, yeah. you know, I, I think it's more than that. Yeah. So, you know, I just kept on plugging and knocking on doors and eventually landed, uh, landed at Random House and found the right person. And it just went from there. And 
ended up being on the McLean's bestseller list. So you know, that, that was very satisfying and gratifying. And the, uh, and then I went to uh, pitched it to CBC and right away it was well, well received and said, okay, let's do it. And then we just started writing scripts and all that kind of fun stuff. And, and here we are. Here we so, are. so that's the common denominator between, um, uh, you too, and, and, and starting a business. We've talked about this a number of times. If you get a, a good idea, there's a big difference between somebody that has a lot of ideas right. and never brings them to fruition and the other people that just plow ahead and say, you know what, I can do this. And uh, Glenn, to your, you know, obviously uh, being the brother of, of, of Wayne is, uh, you know, sometimes you sit in the background, but I've known you for years and nothing stopped you from, taking a project and moving ahead. And it a lot of times had nothing to do with Wayne and, and Lori, same thing. Look at, look at all that you've become. We've known each other for years and we mm-hmm. were just like starting in, in business. I uh, saw you at the uh, hockey camps in the beginning. And then next thing you know, you're involved with bio steel and doing books and because you just, you're passionate about projects, but you don't stop there. You follow up and you accomplish the goals that you set out for. And most of the time, and, yeah. and that's a big, that's why we have so many of these great ventures. Very much uh, practicing what you preach and what has been uh, demonstrated as well in, in the book. So so moving to to that, you, you mentioned, Glenn, that you had broken ground with Random House. Did that make this process, uh, and, and this could uh, be posed to, to you as well, Laurie, was, was this, was this uh, a little bit of an easier sell given the idea that you had? I mean, it's such, it's such an obvious idea once you think about it. Uh, but you'd already broken ground with a ground with a, a publisher. Was the process of selling this uh, somewhat more straightforward than pitching an idea of waking up Wally? Um, Go ahead, Laura. Okay, uh, it was it was a little bit different because um, uh, Glennie's um, contact with Random was more on the adult side, where this okay. is more kids' books. So. We had, I don't, I don't remember how many meetings planning, but we, we went to a few different publishers and, you know, it was kind of like literally what this break two book is all about is like, even though you don't get it the first time, keep trying. Right. (laughs) We We were kind of like a dog with a bone on this, on this book and the idea. And everyone's like, this is great. We went to a a few publishers that like, this is going to be too big for us. We can't do it. We're like, wait, what? And then, um, and then dealing with some, with Glennie's first contact, she's like, I love it. It's great. And we actually created our own prototype when we went in. She said, but it's not, you need to deal with the kids section, which was Penguin uh, at the time. So anyway, they got us hooked up and right. uh, it definitely helped a lot, but it was still, it was still was not the easiest project project to get started and get going on. And then of course, now that we have it they're they're over the moon and they're really excited about um, great did very well. It became a bestseller, which is we're super proud of and great too is already um, if you go to Indigo and look on the on the computer there, it's already listed as a best bestseller, which we're super excited about because it Amazing. just launched on October twelfth. So, um, so yeah, it was it was not the easiest process, but it was one that we were just we're going to make this happen for sure. And it was all for Wally. We just wanted to make sure we had this special um, keepsake that kids could have of Walter. Well, you mentioned uh, you know a keepsake for the kids about Walter, um, um, but this process of writing this book took quite a long time. I, I have read, and can you confirm if this is if this is correct or not, that um, uh, Walter was able to read at least a draft of this book prior to its publication. Was was he able to to get the full sense of what this book was? Great too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When we wrote the first one, as we were writing the first one, we we're like, hey, okay. We probably have enough here for two, three, four more books. So we actually started writing great two pretty much as we were writing the first one. We had the ideas and we were, you know, took notes and thinking about what the second one would be. So we've I think we finished this one two years ago and it, it's a process from mm-hmm. finishing the book and then actually hitting the shelves. So I, I think that process took two years. Mm-hmm. So we, we, we had had a copy, not a physical copy, but we had, uh, we had read it to my dad a couple of times and, you know, obviously it's sad and, you know, too bad that he's not here for it, but, but he definitely, he got a chance to see it, to, That's hear, great. to read right. it. Now you mentioned that, you know, I, I said earlier, it's almost like such an obvious idea when you think about it, how great of a, of a concept this is for a children's book. But if you're, if I start, in a meeting with someone and I say, I've got an idea. I'm coming with, with the Gretzky name and we're going to do a kid's book. The first thing they're going to say is, 
okay, Wayne Gretzky is the main character. What are we doing? And you say, no, no, no. They say, okay, fine. It's about Walter. What what are we doing? Walter is the main character. What are we doing? But you guys chose to go in a different direction with this, placing Taylor as the primary character in both Great and Great 2. Taylor being, uh, I'm assuming, just a, a blank avatar onto which the, the reader can can put their own experiences on. Um, was was that part of the decision making process? How at what point in the creative process did that hit you that you wanted to make the main character someone other than Wayne or Walter? I think um, what we the reason we did that was so that the kids, the age group that are, are reading this book, can automatically right away understand and relate to that character. Right. So they're going, yeah, I have a coach like that. That coach is great, right? So it's more about the kids' point of view versus. Yeah a lot of others. And obviously the adults get everything else or innuendos that go on within the book. But um, I think that's why we chose that way because we wanted it again, to be really focused on coach Wally and his teachings. And in order for that to happen for kids reading the book, they had to kind of be that character and to be able to envelop that. Almost allowing them to become uh, someone onto whom Walter would have imparted his wisdom, which is is great. Like part of the team, like they became part of the team. Exactly. Um, Now, how much of Walter's specific teachings go into this book? How much of it informs even down to the the writing of the book? You know, I'm thinking about a line, for example, uh, uh, Walter speaking with Taylor and says, if you're going to do something, make sure you're focused and do it right. And that almost feels like a line that you would have taken directly from something that he has said. Was 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 there direct one to one uh, bits of information that that Walter would often repeat and, and that you wanted to verbatim put into the book was that was that part of your your thinking in this? I, I think all of it is based around him and his teachings and his sayings. The you know I wouldn't put one thing specific. I think just in, in general, everything that he would say or speak to kids and his interactions with them. I think that's what we captured and and put in the book. If you if you've uh, ever had the uh, opportunity to sit and talk with Wayne, so often in the conversation, uh, he will quote his dad, uh, and and it all is in this book as well, in the books, things that Walter would continually say that inspired Wayne or he kept as a mantra came from his dad and he will quote his dad so many times. And that's what you see in the book as well. So if you want to get a little perspective on how to be the great one, uh, <laughs> take a look at the book as well. Cause it's, it's all there. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned, I think, I think it was more of what my dad was about. It was, he, he was just a soft and gentle man. And I, I don't think my dad had too many enemies out there. Mm. And but I think it was just that, he was a caring person mm-hmm. and always wanted everyone to succeed. It didn't matter if you're the biggest, the smartest or whatever. He always saw the good in everybody. And I yep. think that's kind of what we try to portray in the books about him is, is that side of, you know, just not, Hey, I've got the, maybe the greatest hockey player as a son, but for my dad, it was both always being there and helping everybody, just not you know, right. individuals. Right. Yeah. Right. And every, everybody has a place on the team, right? You might not be the smartest or the strongest or the fastest, but you're part of the team and there's a reason that you're there. Right. I like that. And I, I also, uh, we could talk a little bit about the illustration as well, because I'm, a, I, I know that you would have had uh, several conversations leading up to the, the release or, or the, the development of, of the, the illustrations with Kevin Sylvester. Um, was it, you know, there, there's part of the writing that, that does this naturally, uh, but it's very clear in the drawings in the book, uh, you know, hockey, which, which I think often gets a reputation of being, uh, fairly male and fairly white often. Uh, it seems like you guys put a really good foot forward in in purposely drawing a team that represents different ethnicities, different genders. Uh, it seems very inclusive in that sense. Lori, you mentioned you grew up playing sports as well. Did you ever feel... Uh, you know, in reading something like a children's book, maybe something like The Sweater, a famous book, you know, not mm-hmm. having representation of women in those books, was it important for you to make sure that this was something that was that felt a little bit more inclusive? 
Yeah, for, I think it was important for us both, you know, Glennie and I talked about that. I mean, it's interesting. It's very different from when I was playing sports where um, now there's there's girls on hockey teams, girls and boys are playing together. Like in my son's league, again, he's nine. They they play girls and boys together. Right. And there's so many new kids um, coming in and being part of it. That that was de- definitely a very por- important part of it, because, again, that's what the kids are living right now. Right. right? And we wanted to make them feel right at home and like this is the team that I want to be on. Right. Uh, I, so I mentioned Kevin Sylvester as well and, uh, and, and him, him being the, the illustrator of this. And I'm curious, you know, it seems as though, uh, Glenn, you, you and, and Lori would, would have had a lot of input obviously into the actual writing and the text of the book, but I'm always curious about how much control the authors would have over the overall look and feel of the illustrations on the page. What describe to me what the conversations with Kevin Sylvester are like? Are you are you gearing him towards a specific illustration style because he does have a very unique style? Or are you trying to get him out of his element a little bit? Or are you kind of trusting that he can take the words and and bring it to life the way that an illustrator can? I think it was a bit of everything. One thing about Kevin is he, he was on right on the same page as Lori and I right from the get go and. Mm. He's very, very easy to work with. There, he, he knew what we sort of wanted, and um, it, it just actually re- really flowed very easily. Mm-hmm. He, he, he's an amazing illustrator. Oh, my God. So yeah. he got it right away. He had met my dad a few times before, too. So that was, you know, half the battle right there. So he he pretty much captured everything that, you know, Lori and I would want wanted. Yeah, he's fantastic. And how did you go about getting introduced to him? Was that something that you seeked out or did, did uh, random house put you in touch with him knowing that he would be a good fit for this project? That was random house. So when we, when we um, worked with them together on just getting the book done, they also said, okay, here's some op- here's some options for illustrators. So Glennie and I went through each one of them and looked at them and we just picked Kevin right away. And, and again, and then just meeting him, it was just such an easy Thing. And he was he was a big Walter fan and a big hockey fan and a big kid fan. He's done a, a lot of different children's books. So he just like Glenn said, it, we were just a really great team working right from the beginning. That's fantastic. Um, I do have a question about sort of the the you know, you mentioned when you were writing the first book, you immediately realized you potentially had enough content for four or five books, you know, given the number of lessons that Walter uh, could have and was known to 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 impart onto onto to children around him and, and people around him. The first book is very clearly about the concept of effort, trying, recognizing what greatness is in yourself as opposed to doing great things on the ice, uh, being a part of a larger whole and being great that way. Taylor often tries and and fails in his mind, uh, but Walter is constantly there to encourage him to try again. And it's very often, in fact, I believe always, someone else on the team who gets the goal but it's Taylor who's there to get the assist. And as a message for children out there who can't, you know, not everyone can be the goal scorer. I think that was, that was great. And it moves directly on from there to the second book. It's more about developing confidence. Taylor has proven himself. And now it's about, uh, he has a little bit of a uh, performance issue in, in front of a, a larger group of, uh, of, of, of viewers. And it's about rebuilding that confidence in him. So from effort to confidence, if there were a third book, what would one word be? that could describe the tone or the message that you would be trying to, to instill in it? That's Way a great put, question. Put them on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> they hadn't gone that far. You can tell by the hesitancy. Well, no, we have, we have gone that far actually. It's just, which one do we choose? Right. You know, is yes. it respect? Right. Is it, you know, kindness? Is it like, there's so many different, again, um, Walterisms that we can work with. So that's, that's something that we're just trying to work out right now on what we want that next one to be for sure. Nice. I like that. And so you guys, uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure if you're able to confirm this or not, but you are actively working on, on the sequel to great two. Well, we have lots of ideas, put it that way. <laughs> okay. Like that's fair. <laughs> as long as it keeps, you go. Yeah. yeah. As yeah. long as it's as popular as it is. You got to keep it coming. It's like a, it's like a great uh, Netflix series. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You, just, you can't exactly. wait for the next well, one. I think to the come next out. one's going to be even better. The next one will be even better. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love to hear that. You learn as you go, right? So, but this one's just in time for Christmas. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. There you go. We'll see. We'll see how sure it does. Hey, you mentioned Lori. It's already being featured on Indigo's page as as a bestseller, uh, and this is only a couple of weeks after the release. As you mentioned, yeah. October twelfth was the was the day that it came out. Yeah. Uh, had big big shoes to fill, and it seems to be doing just that. Um, I I do I do want to kind of focus on this whole idea as well of of sports. I mentioned earlier, you know, we worked with, uh, we have worked in, in several different uh, aspects of sports and di- in different sports themselves. And we do find that hockey is, is a great community sport in a lot of ways, but sport in general has a lot of messages to teach to kids. Um, you know, there were a lot of settings you could have used for for a children's book. What is it about the sports setting you think that kids take to so well and why is it so effective in teaching them these sorts of lessons? Well, I think it's first be, being around people and I think interacting and I think you learn from different situations and when you're in a team environment and maybe just not maybe individual sports, you know, tennis or golf, I think you, you, you learn so many different things, accountability, uh, re- respect for your coaches or and, and your parents. I remember my dad would would say after every practice or every game when we'd leave the dressing room, he would say, all right, boys and girls, you know one thing, what are we going to do when we get home tonight? And they would all say, thank mom and dad. Oh, and that's great. That, oh, that's, wow. a, yeah. that's a true thing that my dad would, before we leave every arena, every dressing room, that's what he'd make sure. And geez, after about two weeks, he would just ask the question and every boy and girl would say, well, we're going to thank our mom and dad. That's amazing. And That's fantastic. I yeah, never knew that. Really was. It's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He would do that uh, after every game, every practice, before we left the dress room. That's after, before he made everyone clean up the dress room. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. That's good, though. It's, Don't it's leave teaching. the tape on the floor. Put it in the garbage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know exactly, oh, yeah. it, Brian. You, you, you were there in the dressing room with him yes. during fantasy camp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was he was such a uh, a star around there. I mean, uh, as popular as Wayne in a lot of respects. He'd be walking around, talking to everybody. He'd be picking the teams uh, with uh, with Charlie, and uh, yeah. just he was always around, always a smile on his face. Uh, everybody jumped to try and get the seat next to him on the bus, and, and yeah. all that. Yeah. Oh I yeah. No, it was amazing. Like I. I remember I was telling the story the other day. We, if we were going to fantasy camp or just if we were traveling anywhere, I, I would leave three or four hours early to get to the airport with him, just because it took that long for him to talk to anybody. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I, I remember one time we, we literally made the plane by my two minutes, I think, and I'm like, okay, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> so, like he basically would talk to everybody in the airport and. And I think that that was the greatest thing about him is he mm. just had time for everybody, like absolutely anyone in the world. And and I think for I think the people who were lucky and fortunate enough to to get to know him, I, I think he he touched a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, to that end, you know, it's just a thought. Here's another concept for a book. Just my dad's just, pitching you guys now. No, just no, in case. this just, is the, this just, is okay, this is the Trojan go. horse to get some ideas into you. When, when I did Eddie's book, one of the things I thought about was a, a fellow a friend of mine had come up. Well, one of the guys from the camp, Fraser Neek, and he and he told me this story about um, Eddie and and uh, something that had occurred, and uh, and and I thought, well, what, you know what? Part of this book should be there's so many stories out there that people have. And so we ran a little contest and everybody sent in a, a, a memory a, and then we picked 10 of them to put in the book. Your father, if you, if you did something like that and what you just said about the dressing room, you know, I know a lot of stuff about your dad, but I never knew that one. And yeah. I got a little emotional listening to that because <laughs> know. Yeah. my father was the same way. He was a very generous, well-loved guy. And so those are stories that, there must be thousands of stories. Like I can name 20 of them myself sure. uh, that, that people would share that would touch people's hearts. So you, you could fill an encyclopedia with things from, from your dad's world that, that people, memories that people had of them. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, 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 sure. I do want to, to briefly talk about this. We, we try not to, to bring up COVID all that often on the podcast. We like to think that a podcast is often a, an escape for that, but we do, 
you know, we're, we're hopefully coming out on the other side of this. And we do still have a fascination with what everyone did in order to uh, uh, cope with what was going on. You mentioned with the winery, uh, the changes that have gone, how there was a, a direct shift to e-commerce, which is very familiar to, to us at Frameworth as well. But you've now launched two books uh, in the great series. One was pre-COVID and one was after. Um, the other major difference, I think, in the launch of Great 2 is that Walter wasn't around to to experience it uh, with you as well. But what are the major differences? Launching, advertising, ensuring sales pre and, and post-COVID. Was, was there much of a, a change uh, to navigate there? Well, I'll, I'll touch on it first. Is I think the biggest thing is with Great... Laurie and I did a lot of book signings right. at different bookstores, uh, different schools. We did readings. That is probably that I can think of is mm-hmm. the biggest change. We did uh, we did a great event last week at there's a there's a school elementary school in Brantford called the Walter Gretzky mm. Elementary School, and Laurie and I we did a reading in the gymnasium to uh, I think it was grades two and three. So we did a reading there and then we, it was great. We streamed it to every classroom and the school board. So that was fun. But I, I think just the top, off the top of my head, I think that's the biggest change, right, Laura? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Normally we'd be like, we read at schools, you know, different schools and classes and a lot of different book signings. And, you know, this is more, we're fortunate to thank you again for having us on your podcast. We're doing a lot, you know, different Zoom things, but along with that, like last we, we wanted to make sure that Walter was still involved in it. And that's why we had it at the Walter Gretzky school, which was really special for us. Right. right. Um, and a little, sometimes kind of hard to read the book. Cause you know, we were I was yeah. feeling, you know, feeling a bit emotional, but I, I knew that he was there with us still, which was really exciting, but yeah, Glenn's right now, you know, more, mostly we'd be out doing things and we just can't do that now, which is unfortunate, but um, it's still doing really well. And again, we appreciate the opportunities that we're getting. Absolutely. Uh, that that event looked like it was very special. I saw some photographs. Mm-hmm. There was a write up as well. Uh, uh, you were asked what, and uh, you know, not to not to to take from the article, but but it was an answer you gave that 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 I found kind of interesting. Was it, you were asked what Walter would have said had he been at that event uh, with you guys as as you were doing the reading, and uh, would you be able to let us know if he were there with you on the stage, what what his thoughts would be, what he may have said to the kids there? Well, he would have been shocked. <laughs> yeah the very very small things were, were always big to him so mm-hmm. he he would just he would have been amazed and just I, I think really proud of the fact that you know what Lori and i wrote and how it was received and having all the kids there you know the, the, the kids were awesome the kids were great yeah they were great and i think he, he just would have been you know, more amazed that this actually happened. Yeah. So I, I think that would be the biggest thing. Yeah. I, I know Glennie and I really appreciate also Wayne doing the forward for the book. We really appreciate that. It means a lot, obviously, to us. And it's it's pretty exciting for us to have, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I've read those forwards as well uh, by Wayne there. They're great and very heartfelt. Uh, add a lot to the book as well. I think what you guys have done is absolutely great. Laurie, uh, you know, you, you, you've got your work that you're doing with BioSteel as well and still managing to, to, to keep a hand in this. Um, would we be able to get from you a little bit about what what your your day-to-day responsibilities would be at, at BioSteel as well? That's fascinating well, to me. You know, what? before she starts, there bio steel is not that old right how how or or is it just me it's just thinking about, everything no it's it's about 12 12 years now okay but 12 right years from the beginning very beginning it's still young in the business world for sure right i, I remember when it first came out and it's oh yeah. here's another drink and i didn't know what it was and yeah then i saw it at mario lemieux's fantasy yes. camp and that was the first real kind of thing that I, and then i find out that Lori's involved in a big way behind yeah. it and next thing I know, they're naming arenas and they're doing, in a 12 year period, what an amazing success story that has been. And you've been a big part of that. So go ahead. And, I just wanted to preface oh. that because it's blown me away how big oh, it's got so quickly. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been <clears throat> a really fun ride with this company for sure. And glennie has been there with it as well from day one and doing a lot of different things that we do. And I'd be like, do you like this flavor? And <laughs> different things like that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been really great. I, I started, it was supposed to be just like a part-time thing to help them with, uh, the bio still camp that we run for, uh, you know, different hockey players in the summertime. And that just turned into a full-time position of, we do the bio still all Canadian game. We do hashtag camp, which is 
massive and huge with a training camp with a lot of NHL players, which is now kind of known as the pre NHL training camp, training camp. Big time, um, yeah. That, yeah. So that's a big thing. Um, so I run all of those events and then also work together with different programs within the community and working with different um, companies and teams and lots of different things like that, but, and a lot of kids, right? So again, dear to our hearts. So it's just, just turned into a really amazing company, really great people to work with. It's a tight knit group, probably a lot like Frameworth where it's pretty that's small and tight and just those people that are really malleable and quick and fast. And that's grown into a big company, but we still have, you know, the core heartbeat of it, that it's, it's really exciting. And it's, I've been really fortunate to work with them as well. Do you know, I, I, I didn't uh, realize this, but I ended up uh, finding a link to, to the YouTube videos that, that you had yeah. of the camp day one, two, three, four. Yeah. You got to check this out. Cause I know a few of the players that we deal with um, are excited about going to the camp. Yeah. I mean, they, they use that, as you mentioned, as the beginning of training camp. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, you know, third line guys that want to, you know, there are some, but third line guys that want to get into shape before the season. Starts. I'm talking about the elite stars in the NHL. Yeah. Consider yeah. this uh, one of the things that they have to have to do right. to get ready for the season. Right, right. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's become enormous as well. And it's, it's, it's now synonymous, uh, with, with sport. It feels, um, uh, Glenn, I do have one more question for you before we go as well. You've been involved in movies. I believe you were, you were an actor as well in prom night too. Is that, is that, yeah, I, I was. That right? <laughs> no, you were Yeah, that's, that's false. That's false. Okay. Uh, yeah. we, we won't, we won't go there. Um, so you've been involved in movies. <laughs> been, he should be, he should be in movies. Let's just say that. Well, he I, be I mean, movies. it's part of the Gresky family now too, because, uh, Long Trevor's, acting. Trevor's I made, doing yeah, I made movies. an appearance in that one. There you go. There you go. Well, it's more than I've done in movies. So, so yeah. you, you got that one up on me. Uh, I was young. Been, I was stupid. I needed the money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not usually the kind of movie I go for if I, if I need the money, but that's you know, we'll, we'll, we'll teach their own. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, so you've been involved in, in pro producing movies, at least writing books, uh, developing a winery, a lot of hands in a lot of different, uh, uh, elements that, that aren't necessarily related to one another. Is there one type of project that you haven't done yet that, uh, you'd be most curious about trying your hand in? No, you know what? I, I just kind of roll the punches and I, I, I love working on projects and whether it's like Lori had touched on. The, the nationwide tour event up in Collingwood was, was it amazing? It, it was three years, but it really was basically five years, a year to, yeah. before that to get it going. And then, you know, year after to wind it down. So it was, it was almost a four, almost a five year project. Mm -hmm. And that, that was great. I like the, the idea of, of, of taking a thought, the idea of something and then seeing it through to the end and making it, just not great, but bigger than what anyone ever would have imagined. Right. You know, and I think most of all the events that Lori and I do, you know, I think we just, for some reason, you know, not to toot our own horn here, but we just take it to the next level. And it's just, it's absolutely like the, the amazing part about it is making it huge and bigger yeah. and better than what anyone ever thought it would be. Uh, you know, and I yeah. played in that first year of that nationwide, uh, event up in uh, Collingwood. Mikey, you caddied for I me did. too. As far as I remember, I was a caddy there. What? Yeah. That's awesome. Pro probably the greatest golf. <laughs> you were young and needed the money. I was yeah. young and needed the money. Exactly. I needed the booze at that no, point. I think. No, <laughs> yeah. I, I fired his brother because he lost the bottle of booze that was in my golf bag that <laughs> smoothed my swing out. But, uh, That's awesome. but we had so much fun in that event. I mean, and yeah. the biggest stars, uh, not just in golf, but in, in, um, well, Charles Barkley, yeah. you hung out with him for the better yeah. part of the evening yeah. and, uh, uh, God, just one after another. Yeah. That, it was, it was just sad afterwards in the bar after the game and just that. We Old stories. The, no, absolutely. Uh, if you're interested in the book, you can go check out great and great two. They're available, uh, wherever you get your books or you can get them, as we mentioned in e-reader format, Glenn Gretzky, Lori Halomas. Thank you so much for joining us. Brian Aaronworth, president of Frameworth Sports Marketing, and myself, Mikey Aaronworth. This was the Sign Off Podcast, and this is us signing off. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we made it to the end of yet another episode. Thanks again so much for joining us. You can find videos of all of our episodes on YouTube by searching The Sign Off Podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at Frameworth Sport or Instagram at Frameworth Sports. 
And hey, if you're not sick of me yet, you can find me on Twitter over at, at Retrograde Mikey, or you can always find me embarrassing myself over on Instagram at Aaronworth. The sign off is a proud product of Fadu Productions and Sad Styles Productions, executive producers Mikey Aaronworth and Andrew Bascom. Until next week, this is Mikey Aaronworth signing off. Furnished by Sad Styles Productions. Get into it.